Okay, today's discussion about the blood will focus on just the white blood cells. So as we looked at the components of blood the other day, we had about half to more than half the blood was plasma, while the remaining portion are known as the formed elements. That means it's going to be red blood cells in addition to white blood cells and platelets. The white blood cells and platelets together make up what's known as the buffy coat, which is a little white layer, a dusting essentially, on top of the red blood cells. So I have here that red blood cells are 99%. It's 99% of just the formed elements, of just this portion. White blood cells are known as leukocytes. They are indeed white. However, when we look at them on histology slides, they will be a dark purple because the stain used to prepare the slides. There are five types of leukocytes. We can see the schematic draw, representative drawings of each one of them here. We can see on the left the percentage distribution of each of these different cell types. So we can see that neutrophils are most numerous. They, the numbers really vary. We'll see them all over the place. It could be, it used to be really 60 to 75 percent were neutrophils. Now it's expanded to be 40 to 75 percent lymphocytes, therefore about 20 to 40 percent monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. So we can see them to the right. And we'll go through these in a little more um, detail. As a quick way to remember the order of how they go from most to least numerous in the blood specifically, is if we follow this never let monkeys eat bananas, that gives us the order that we know in terms of greatest to least numerous in the blood. The types of leukocytes can be in two big groups. They can either be granulocytes, where there's dots inside of the cell, or agranulocytes, and that letter A denotes absent, so they will have no granules. Leukocytes are allowed to migrate. They can move out of the blood. They're not just like a red blood cell, like an inner tube, just surfing through the blood, carrying oxygen. Leukocytes have a lot more engagement abilities. They can actually attach to the wall, migrate out of the blood, go into the tissues. They follow a myriad of chemical stimuli to get to where their target is. So they um, can assist others in migrating into tissue areas. Uh, they in, engage in what's known as phagocytosis. Not all of them do, some of them do, and that means they're going to consume debris. That means they actually, some of these cells will actually bite and engulf, like take in an antigen or say dead skin cell, if we're going to do some tissue repair, if there's been a cut or damage, will actually bring in these these dead cells or antigens into the cell, their cell, the sphagocytic cell, and actually digest it. Neutrophils is the most numerous in the blood. It's about 40 to 75 percent, often known as polymorphonuclear or PMNs or polys. You'll see that they have what's known as a crazy nucleus. We expect cells to have one nice solid round nucleus. A neutrophil will have like these weird lobular, there's like lobes and then a little segment and then another lobe and another segment. So they're just crazy looking nuclei. The neutrophil is also known as a granulocyte. So we can see the granules inside. Neutrophils contain a granule that's sort of a bleach-like substance. They don't always pick up the stain when we look at them under a microscope. In general, we consider, for the purposes of this class, if you have an elevated neutrophil count, it may indicate an acute bacterial infection. There are certainly many other conditions that it may be associated with, but at this point and the level that we're addressing with regards to the white blood cell, we're trying to find just very general categorizations of these initially. So the neutrophil, the consideration that it's acute, meaning it's a short term, a recent onset, and because neutrophils are considered to be the first responder, because they're the most numerous in the blood, you will see their, their levels elevated right away if there is a recent or acute bacterial infection. 
this is what neutrophils actually look like. We can actually see the granules here. We can see the crazy nucleus. The nucleus is very inconsistent from one to the other, but we can certainly see that they aren't a standard looking nucleus. Lymphocytes are the second most numerous in the blood, but they are the number one most numerous in the whole body because the majority of lymphocytes are actually hidden out in the tissues. So they constitute about 20 to 45% of the white blood cells that are circulating in the blood. These guys are part of our specific immune system. They are indeed our B and T cells. They are known as A granulocytes because there are no granules inside. They tend to have a very large nucleus and very little cytoplasm. Again, with the generalizations, if we have an elevated level of lymphocytes in the blood, then you can might first consider that a person may have an ongoing viral infection. In this histology image, we can see a lymphocyte here. I'd like you to notice the very large nucleus and just a small sliver on towards the top of the cytoplasm. This guy over here is a neutrophil. Monocytes, when they escape the blood, they are actually called macrophages when they get out into the tissues. These guys are very phagocytic in that they will ingest particles they will consume other, either other damaged cells or invader type cells, whether it's damaged skin cells in a cut just to clean out the area before skin repair can occur, um, an invading antigen, even oxidized LDL. It is these monocytes turn macrophages in the subendothelial space along the vessels that actually ingest oxidized LDL molecules and create foam cells, which is essentially what atherosclerotic plaque is. You should know monocytes are called monocytes in the blood. In the tissue, they are macrophages. They are 2 to 8 percent of the circulating white blood cells. And if there are a higher level than two to eight percent in the blood, it tends to be a more chronic type of infection. They take a while for them to increase in numbers. So if monocytes are elevated, it means the problem has been going on for some time. Eosinophils are somewhat rare to see. They're about one to four percent. They are present in greater numbers in the presence of parasites as well as an allergic reaction. The following cell that we're going to talk about is also responsible, or responsive to allergic reactions. So to make the distinction, these eosinophils are bright pink. We see them over here on the side. Both of these are eosinophils. They are bright pink. That's the main way that you're going to identify them. They are increased in numbers under conditions of a parasitic infection as well as allergies. Basophils, that's here in the center, they tend to be polka dotted. You will see them as lots of blue dots. They also have a crazy nucleus, but you rarely get to see the crazy nucleus because it's often obscured by the blue dots. What are in the blue dots? Histamine. So when you take an antihistamine, you are blocking basophils from releasing these histamine granules at areas where perhaps, say, if someone has a, a pollen allergy, that's part of your body where pollen enters, which would be your, your nasal cavity. Basophils are most prominently, play a prominent role in allergic reactions. So if their numbers are elevated, the person is having an allergic reaction. So in a white blood cell differential, it is looking at a blood side where you can identify the various different types of white blood cells and determine a percentage of them. So here we see this is a neutrophil, this is a monocyte, this is a lymphocyte. In this picture, we see a monocyte and these three guys over here are neutrophils. So some of the leukocyte tests are a white blood cell differential, and that's what we're going to do in class, 
or be able to identify and discern between different types of white blood cells. There's also a white blood cell count. If you have a low white blood cell level, you'd have leukopenia. If you have a high level, it's leukocytosis. So we'll just get a head start on the immune system. I'd like to cover the lymphatic component today. So part one of our lymph and immune system is the lymph. So the lymphatic system, we're gonna go through each of these. If we consider a normal capillary network, we have arterioles arriving into a capillary bed, venules bringing blood out and away from the capillary bed. Well, lymphatic vessels also bring blood out and away um, from the tissue area. Any fluid that has escaped and left the capillary bed has actually entered the tissues but doesn't return to the capillary vessels and go out the venules will actually return back to the blood via lymphatic vessels. We can see this schematic here where we have an art artery or arterial bringing blood into a capillary network. Oxygen exchange, fluid escape, some fluid escapes. It's normal to have a little bit of a fluid escaping. An excessive amount of fluid leaving the tissue levels would result in edema. So any fluid that gets out into the tissues will be picked up by the green lymphatic vessels that we see here in this image to the left. The fluid then return all the way back, ends up going into the subclavian veins, so that fluid is indeed completely returned to the blood. Lymphatic fluid is the fluid that has escaped out the capillaries and has remained in the tissues. We make about three liters per day. If there is too much that has escaped and we have a lot of extra fluid going out and hanging around in the tissues, that is edema. The composition of lymphatic fluid is really similar to plasma in that there's a lot of water, we may have some electrolytes, some proteins, some um, small proteins, glucose, no red blood cells will be in there. They tend, they're too big to escape out the capillary. Indeed, white blood cells can even be bigger than red blood cells, but because of their migratory capabilities and their ability to squeeze through and maneuver out of the blood, we will indeed see white blood cells in the lymphatic fluid. In the GI tract only, the lymphatic fluid would include fat. The absorption of fat from our digestive system actually goes directly into the lymphatic fluid. In fact, an excessive amount of fat in your diet after a meal could result in a milky white appearance of the lymphatic fluid. The function of lymph is to remove excessive interstitial fluid. Too much remaining in the tissues is edema. This can happen either you have an excessive amount of pressure driving the fluid in or some sort of obstruction preventing fluid from leaving. Either of those would increase edema accumulation and therefore increase the need of lymphatic drainage. The pathway of lymphatic fluid going through a series of lymph node after lymph node is our way of alerting our immune system if there happens to be any antigens in the tissue that got picked up along with the lymphatic fluid. So these antigens are taken care of in the lymph nodes prior to being returned to the blood. In addition, the function of lymph is to transport fat that's been absorbed in the gut. Lymphatic vessels are similar to veins in that they're very low pressure. They contain valves so that fluid running through lymphatic vessels, even if you're standing up, won't fall back down because they have valves that prevent backflow. When lymph returns to the body, it does it in an unequal distribution. About 75% of the lymph is going to return to the left subclavian vein via the thoracic duct. The remaining 25% is going to return into the right subclavian vein via the right lymphatic duct.
you can see here is the pathway of a series of lymph nodes coming up through the torso, terminating into the subclavian veins on either side. So lymphatic vessels do not follow really next to the specific, their parallel or counterpart venules, but they do indeed go up towards the thoracic cavity and then they return via the blood. Lymph returns to the thoracic cavity by inspiration, which creates a negative pressure inside the thoracic cavity. When you take a breath in by dropping the diaphragm to create space in the thoracic cavity, it actually not only brings air into the lungs, but it brings both lymphatic flow as well as venous flow back to the heart or back into the thorax. The valves prevent backflow while skeletal muscles squeeze together to move the lymph forward or upward. This image at the top to show arterial flow in, the cross the capillary network and then to the venules to go back to the heart. Any excessive fluid that may have come out into the tissues will now enter this lymphatic system which is a second drainage system allowing that fluid to also leave the area. The lymphatic vessels have a series of lymph nodes interspersed throughout the system. So you have lymphatic fluid coming into these lymph nodes. It goes through the center of the lymph node and then out on the other side. Within the lymph node, we will learn about in the next lecture, are components of our immune system that can identify and remove any potential harmful antigens that might be traveling through the lymph.